Welcome to another episode of the Silk and Steel podcast. I'm your host, Carl Za. Today we have a very special episode. We're going to have the food episode. And、uh, I have with me、uh, Professor Miranda Braun,、uh, who is a specialist in food history,、uh, particularly Chinese food history. Is that correct?、Uh, Professor, yes, yes, yes. I, I wouldn't want to talk about anything else. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. That's what we're here to do on this、uh, Thanksgiving break.、Uh, while everybody is stuffing their face with turkey, we're going to talk about food. Uh, 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 Professor Brown, could do you mind to give a brief introduction to my audience、uh, who you are, what you do, etc.? etc. Okay, so you're, you're looking for what just a、uh, social security number and major <laughs> your credit card, really? That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah.、Um, who am I?、Um, I mean, I'm, I'm your friend. I think that's,、um, I think, obvious enough.、Um, I've been teaching at Michigan、um, in the Department of Asian Languages and Cultures since 2002.、Um, I started my career as a classicist. So I worked in、uh, mostly Han Dynasty materials, and then I moved into a, a medical history of China for、um, about 10 years. And then I Got interested in food history when I started teaching、um, a survey course on the food and drink of Asia.、Um, and then at that point, I realized that there was no turning back. I had finally found what I was interested in. I've been following you on Twitter.、Uh, I think that's how I found you initially because you always tweet some very interesting tidbits,、uh, little known facts about food and、uh, Chinese food traditions and their origins.、Uh, so, What, what do you have for us,、uh, Professor? <laughs> professor, okay. <laughs> We don't have to do that.、Um, I, tonight, I don't know what I have for you.、Um, I, I was just looking at a picture from a, a Tang Dynasty. It was like a modern depiction of a Tang Dynasty banquet that was done either in the late Tang or maybe in the Five Dynasties right after the Tang、um, sort of collapse. And it was a banquet that was,、um, I believe, held in the、um, capital of Chang'an after someone. Sort of、um, became a, you know, an official member of the bureaucracy. And it was this sort of really scrumptious aristocratic banquet with,、um, I think, features that we don't generally associate with、um, Chinese cuisine, namely dairy.、Um, and that, you know, I think reflects the fact that the Tang Dynasty was an extremely cosmopolitan era、mm. and that there was a lot of influence from Central Asia. Um, and from the nomadic world,、um, both at the court and in the major city centers.、Um, so, that, I guess that would be my tidbit. That is fascinating because I have never pictured dairy as part of the traditional Chinese diet. I mean, growing up, I always thought, you know, like the dairy,、uh, especially any kind of milk product, is a very recent introduction into China. I mean, of course, I grew up. In China,、uh, drinking milk, but I, I always thought that was that something happened like in the early 20th century or the 19th century, something that Europeans brought to China.、Uh, but I did not know this whole history of dairy in Chinese food stretching back to Tang Dynasty. That's like a thousand years ago. Oh, wait, I think it goes b- b- before that. I mean, certainly, you know, there are references to it in the Han Dynasty. I mean, You know, fresh milk consumption was not an everyday thing, you know, at least in, the, in recent centuries and in, in you know, what I would consider the core agricultural regions of the country.、Um, um, and, it, and by the way, it, you know, it wasn't very common if you go back 400 years in Europe.、Um, you know, this sort of fresh milk dairy industry is something that is actually very recent in, in sort of Western cuisine、um, for a variety of reasons, including the fact that it's, you know, Hard to keep things fresh and safe when you don't have refrigeration or pasteurization.、Um, but the sort of idea that, you know, sort of dairy consumption itself, you know, you find it in, in a number of places in, in China, including the court.、Um, so one of the things I found was that, you know, Emperor Wu Di actually had picked up the habit of drinking kumis、um, from the Xiongnu, who, you know, were the main well, challenges of the Han Dynasty. Oh, from, from the Han Dynasty. Well, I... well, you had a specific bureau. Yeah, that was just used to make kumis. They called it sort of beaten horse milk.、Um... Mm-hmm. Have, you tried, have you tried horse mare milk? 
<laughs> only distilled um you know for, you know in um, inner mongolia they they make it it's not expensive my, my friends just order it from you know taobao and then we you know get it and it's a few bucks um it's it's i like it it's smooth um i like it better than baijiu it it has um it's a little bit spicy <laughs> and um, i'm not surprised that you like it better than baijiu i mean i i, I tried baijiu when i was five years old at my uh uncle's wedding that that thing tastes nasty <laughs> it tastes like kerosene so no, 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 this is good this is like it smells like it has the aftertaste of ice cream oh wow so it's like tequila, slightly spicy, but at the beginning, and then it finishes with a smooth, like ice cream finish. Um, so I can definitely see a future with mixed drinks. So if you have any friends who are looking for cocktails, I think they do that in Ulaanbaatar. But my understanding is that in, you know in, in in Inner Mongolia they triple process it to make it nice and smooth. Wow, and and you can just order it on Taobao; they will deliver to your door. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean there's a, a lot more variety in in, in terms of you know, food and dairy choices actually in China than there is here. That's that's fascinating. What? So how did the dairy food then disappear from the Chinese diet? I mean, it doesn't disappear. I mean, it, you know, I don't know if you would. You know, there's different ways of consuming dairy. There's, you know, and this is really resource dependent and also class based, right? But in in certain parts of China, like let's say you were in Shandong in the, you know, the Bay Way or the Northern Way Dynasty, there was probably more sort of everyday consumption of dairy in Northern China um, because of a, of a cooling climate and steppe influence and different modes of food production that involved the use of a lot of animals um, and, and production of dried yogurt. But if you're going to go back, let's say you're going to go to Hangzhou, you know, in the 19th century, you will still find elite people consuming dairy either as food or some kind of medicinal food. Um, and, you know, and this is something that you see even in the sort of early 20th century, this idea, um, even in places like Guangzhou, that, you know, milk is a medicinal food. It's supposed to make you stronger and it's, you know, for the rich. Um, but what ends up happening, I think, over the course of the late Ming, early Qing, is that dairy becomes incredibly expensive and becomes a luxury product that people, can, you know, only very, very rich people can afford. And so not surprisingly, the Jiangnan elite in the Ming and Qing you know, we're splurging on dairy. Um, and, mm. and the way that they describe it is some like sensual sort of food that, you know, is I think part and parcel of this excessive lifestyle that merchants or the mercantile elite get to enjoy. So things with cream. Um, but it's, you know, it's something that, you know, the I think the cows were probably, you know, in those families, you know, eating better than the peasants. So, it you know, this is very much a class thing. Mm. I was surprised that uh, I think you wrote about how Lu Yu in his poem or or prose talk about dairy dairy products uh and, and food, or is it Lu Yu? Did I remember? Correctly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the the guy who wrote all the gory poems. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Lu Yu is interesting, right? Because he's a he's a, a Shaoxing guy, um, and um, in the Southern Song, you of course the capital has just moved, you know to. Hangzhou and then the secondary capital would have been Shaoxing, right? These are two areas where they still speak um, a version of, of like, a, you know, an ancient form of Mandarin, right, with Southern influences. Um, but one thing we know is that the Northerners who fled Kaifeng after the Jurchen sacked the area brought their food with them to the South um, in these particular areas in Jiangnan. And so you see the sort of emergence of a, you know, a dairy sort of um, sort of culture in places like Suzhou, which had apparently a lot of milk and, and butter. Um, and so, you know, Lu Yu himself, you know, being kind of what we'd consider patriot or, you know, there's other words that people use. Um, he, you know, was very fond of like goat yogurt um, in particular, because it, it was, you know, in some ways in the Southern Song imagination, the quintessential food of the lost North. Um, mm. And he had it with another quintessential food of the North, which was cherries. Um, mm -hmm. and so there's something that he ate actually a decent amount and talked a bit about. So when he was comparing, for example, something delicious from the South, he was always saying, this is better than even goat yogurt from the North, right? <laughs> it's like, you know, in, in, in Chinese poetry, it's not like you're saying X is better than Y. What you're saying is Y is so good that it's better than even this wonderful thing X. So your wife is even more beautiful than, I don't know, what were they talking about? Angelina Jolie, right? I mean, the assumption being that Angelina Jolie is luscious um, or was, you know, when 
you know, 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, so uh, the the dairy they consume in, in Southern Zone, I assume this is coming from sheep or goat, right? Rather than cow? Both. I mean, cow's milk has a special sort of aura because of Buddhism. Like cow's milk is, you know, considered like cow's milk kanji was considered monk's food in the monasteries. Um hmm. But definitely sheep. Um, it's obviously ambiguous in Chinese. Um, just a fun fact: there is this like breed of sheep that you find in um, the Jiangnan area um, that was brought to the sweltering south during the Southern Song from the north. It's like this furry white sheep, <laughs> and I, I don't know how Chinese like you know sort of shepherds managed but they, they they these things managed to survive there in Jiangnan, i think it's called um uh, tai hu de hu, hu yang. ah okay okay uh so so they they are so for people who don't know Jiangnan is uh, normally referred to the lower yangtze delta region um i i try to make it break it down to basics so people who have a very little geographic historical Shanghai, background of China. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, around area around Shanghai. Yeah. Um and, and Taihu is like I think the second largest or the third largest uh, freshwater lake in China. So I assume by the name they, they probably raise their sheep around the Taihu, right? Lake Tai. Yeah, um, and, and 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 you know some people argue that really Jiangnan is the nine counties that you know that circle and circle that that, that lake. Um, you know, there are different definitions, of course. So can we, can we switch to talk about mantou now? <laughs> or, <Yes>. <laughs> dumplings. Uh, the, cause this is a, there, there was, I know there's a debate, whole debate about who, who made dumpling because there's apparently, uh, you know, different people, different cultures make different style dumplings from china all the way to you know turkey and poland uh but they all share certain similarities so so you know there's always debate about the origin of the dumpling so my understanding is that it arose in the east and it traveled either through the silk road or the mongol conquest further west uh is that is that, is my understanding correct I mean, it's it's hard to know. So I guess I'll start with this, which is that we don't know who the, the daddy of the dumpling ultimately is, right? Um, uh, you know, and we we suspected it was probably initially, you know, some form of lamb or, you know, mutton inside of a wheat wrapper. Mm. Um, wheat, of course, you know, in early medieval China, not being a very common food. Um, but, of course, you know, consumed to some degree in, in the north or in the courts of the north. Uh, so we don't know, probably somewhere Central Asia or what we consider today, you know, sort of the steppe. I hear baby. Um, That's my baby, Kaishi. Yes, you're a baby. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and so, it, it, you know, it, it could be, there, there are different sort of possibilities. Some people think it, you know, it might be a, a Central Asian Turkic people or somewhere in the near east um but we don't know we just know that at some point this label um you know which is today manto in, in modern chinese um it's um and manta in um turkic languages and mandu in korean um and so forth um starts to get used and, it, and it's clear you know to linguists that manto is not originally a chinese word it's it's a loan word from a foreign language um and it's cognate with this Turkic term, manta. And so in, in, in medieval China, um, you know, manta was pronounced something like mandu. Mm, that's maybe that's how the Korean got their term. But w yep. that's interesting. <laughs> but Chinese are the first one to write write about it, right? I mean, manto was, I think, was uh, recorded in a Jin dynasty. I think it was Jin dynasty mm -hmm. food treaties. Uh uh, I believe that was the first ever mentioned in uh, written records. Uh, but of course, they, they use a different Chinese character for manto, uh, but it's still manto. <laughs> the, the sound is still similar. Yeah, they definitely yeah. use. So the Chinese write about everything first, right? That's one of the things um, they do in that text is by Shu Xi. They talk about manto as a foreign 
you know, or they talk about, you know, pasta culture as the names coming from the alleyways and then also the techniques for preparing these things coming from foreign lands. Um, and then with many loan words, you know, the way you write Manto is written differently in different places. Um, so it's some attempt to transliterate, you know, something that a foreign word or capture it. And there's other foreign sounding words in that text as well. But there's no like, what about archaeological evidence? Like, have they uncovered like a frozen manto from like a few thousand years back? Or no, did they discover don't. a fossil, a manto fossil? Uh, because I know they did discover like a fossil of uh, of noodles, like a four thousand year old noodle in northwest China. This uh, because I know this because I had a had a lively discussion with my Italian American boss, uh, you know, about the origin of pasta. <laughs> and he, he used to joke to me about how China Chinese got their pasta from the Italians. So I, I have to Google search this BBC article about, you know, discovery of a four thousand year old noodle fossil in northwest China in Qinghai, I think. Well, yeah, in Qinghai. And it, it's a it's an area that, you know, is sort of let's say has a lot of contact with the nomadic world. Um, you know, that, that particular site has been, I've been surprised at how much debate it solicited, right? Because there's some concern about, you know, they, when they did this sort of like biochemical analysis, they, they, they thought it was some form of millet, which doesn't have any gluten. Um, you know, then there, you know, were questions of where's the equipment, um, you know, and then there's a cont- question of like contamination of the sample. And so, you know, maybe what we're seeing, the millet is, you know, wasn't, is not really in the noodle itself. It might have been something else there, like wheat, you know. And so I think there's, there are many questions that are unanswered about that. Um, you know, I think, you know, I, I'm fairly confident. I wrote about this in a bl- long, long blog um, at one point that, you know, I think it's it's clear that um, wheat products come to China from the Silk Road, right? Because wheat is f- first cultivated in Western sort of Turkey, um, and then the the rotary grindstone also arrives via the Silk Road around uh, 300 BC, um, and that grinding process is very important for. Um, sorry, my daughter's here um, for for sort of processing um, you know, sort of we, you know, sort of like, I guess, berries into something that was flower-like in an efficient way. Um, and probably the first sort of things that show up in China are like, you know, flatbreads, right, which are cooked in ovens. Um, and that probably reflects the fact that there's a preference for using dry heat to treat um, grains in the Mediterranean. So you have like these ancient Egyptian miniatures of um what do you call it? Uh, ovens and bakeries. Um, but there really isn't evidence of people dumping. Mommy, I mean, I'm, I'm, can so. I help you with it? Oh, okay. Mommy's, um, mommy's doing something right now. <laughs> so, Hello. So, that's Hi, Uncle Jessica. Carl. Uh, so we know so, so, no music right now, okay? <laughs> okay, so where was I? Oh, yeah. So the, the point is, is that flatbread shows up in China. And then that at some point becomes, um, you know, I think the Chinese get their hands on these flatbreads and they refer to them as barbarian you know, sort of being, right? Who being, right? Yeah, who being. And, and then they, but the, in, in China, when you sort of cook grains, the dominant method for doing that is to cook it in gruel form or kanji form. And so you're going to, you're going to cook, right? And, and mm. immerse them in hot water. And this was a definite no-no in the ancient Roman world for various religious taboos. Um, and so the Chinese were like taking this bing and they were dumping it in water. And what happens is that once you do that, you know, the gluten relaxes and you can start to stretch things. Right. So mm. I'm pretty sure that, you know, you know, this is probably a, in some ways a fusion product, but there is a definitely sort of a Chinese component to it. Um, and then, you know, as soon as they start playing with hot water and dough or water and dough, they start figuring out you know, that they can do all sorts of things and they develop, discover gluten, you know, from manipulating the gluten. Yeah. They discover gluten when they start taking the dough and putting it into water and that opens up other possibilities. Wow. That's fascinating. Do you have a link to this uh, uh, blog post you wrote? Can you share yeah. with us so I can share with my, my audience? I'll put it in the show notes so people can read all about it. Um, yeah. So it's kind of a long blog and it really kind of opens with my parents fighting about who's invented dumplings um and my dad (laughs) taking the easy way out um 
but you know my mother what's the position i know the position your mom but what what's the position of your dad <laughs> in a you know he's like both sides are innovators you know you, know, <laughs> you don't want to judge this kind of thing and you know especially there are representatives from both communities right the italians mm. and the chinese um but the, it, it's an interesting question um all right but you're you're actually in one of the blogs the the dumpling one Oh really? Okay, cool. I definitely share this link to my <laughs> <laughs> to my patrons followers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, hold on. There's there's the dumpling blog. Yeah. No, I, it was it was what your 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 steam based buns. <laughs> I really enjoyed the monkeys throwing buns. Oh yes, yes. I I figure I figure you must be. Watch out! you go. One of those TikTok videos that I, I reposted on, on Twitter. Oh, that was that was that my my undergraduates read it with great pleasure because and they <laughs> then they started following you afterwards. Oh, because a monkey throwing uh, because a monkey uh, uh, sharing bombs. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that yeah, was they, a great video. Yeah, that, that was actually really funny. They they're like, I don't know who this guy is, but I'm not, I want to find out more. <laughs> he sounds awesome. So I gotta I gotta include more monkeys in my content. <laughs> For more monkey business and the rest of this episode and more premium content, please subscribe to the Silk and Steel podcast at the Patreon page. Just go to patreon.com, search Silk. Silk and Steel podcast should be the first in the result. I put in a lot of time and effort into this podcast, and I do appreciate your support. I hope you enjoy listening, and I hope you subscribe. Bye-bye.